when it's possible, in terms of, of the, of the, the type of scene it is, where the camera is, how close the actors are to the lens and to the camera itself, Paul gets himself down in and under and around the camera. He curls in down there somewhere, um, and so that he has eye contact with you all the time. How many directors don't do this? Many directors watch the box. Um, many directors don't even watch the box. They stand off to the side someplace. I don't know what they're looking at for sure. Um, but Paul gets right down in there so that uh, it's very intimate wh what he does. And it, it's, um, it could be disconcerting. Paul might be two or three feet away from you and, and locking eyes right into you. There's something about the, 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 the hard focus uh, and his physical presence kinesthetically uh, inches away that gives a, a kind of a, a dynamic to the performance that I'm not sure that you can achieve in quite the same way or any other way. It's, it's, it's unusual. Let's say, uh, there are other directors who do this. I, I've seen this a couple times. But Paul does it on virtually every shot. It tells the actor that the director still has an interest in what's going on in this movie. Um, when, when Paul gets down there so close, it's almost like he is helping to will the appropriate performance from you. Because you sense, I mean, it's like, it's like uh, even though he's not saying anything, I always sensed his, uh, I sensed his will. He wanted this thing in a certain way. He wanted certain, certain marks that it, it would not necessarily we had discussed, but I could sense it, that he wanted certain things to happen in certain steps along the way. And um, it was like, uh, like some kind of thought line directly. I mean, I, I don't think I'm the only actor who was affected by this either. I think, um, I think the other actors in, the, in this movie were also affected by it in a way. I've never seen anything quite like it. Interesting thing, technically, in the scene where where Gwyneth is in the hotel room here, as we boom up from her boots to her, there's a small little thing that happens in the background. A light dims. One of the lights in the background is on a dimmer. We bring it down. Um, that will happen again later in the movie, actually, and I'll I'll point it out as it's happening. It's over Philip Earl's monologue where he's explaining to Sam that he doesn't want to die. And this sort of very subtle sort of dimming of, of lights, I, I, I like to do, and I, I kind of did a blatant ripoff from, from something that I saw in Silence of the Lambs. And one of this, in, it was a scene with Jodie Foster and, and, and Anthony Hopkins, where they're in the background, one of the, one of the source lights, one of the, one of the practicals, just dims the slightest bit. And I'd always thought I'd seen it, but then I started to think it was an optical illusion. When I listened to the audio commentary track of the Criterion version, I heard Jonathan Demme talking about it. And I was like, fuck, okay, good, it did happen. Because I thought for the longest time it did happen, I thought it was an optical illusion. And um, I, I've stolen it and just applied it in, in a couple times. I did it a couple times in Boogie Nights, too. It's just the smallest, subtlest little lighting cue that dims down that you know, can mean a lot to a movie, you know, if we wanted to talk real intellectually about it, but boy, it's just so small and cool, and you can just kind of do a small fucking stroke with it, you know? It's fun. And that, that happens over Gwyneth there, um, as she's sort of touching herself and kind of feeling very self-conscious and kind of preparing herself for what might come and asking, do you want to fuck me? Now you really look at me as a piece of shit. The framing here that happens with Philip Baker Hall and this, this sort of way that I compose these shots is very influenced by The Hustler. There's a wonderful scene with Piper Laurie and George C. Scott when he comes in the room and he sort of attacks. He kind of comes at her and they have this big argument. And there's a, there's a portion of him that's so dominating over her and she's sitting on the bed sort of just like Gwyneth is actually. You see George C. Scott's face in it, but, but there's a sort of something to the composition that's so sort of dominating, you know, and just sort of terrifying. And you just, for me as a man watching it, just felt like every man, every asshole moment you've ever had as a man. I don't know, you know, it just, it was very scary the way that the man was put over the woman, the way he was sort of attacking her, you know. He pulled it off. I don't know. You know, he uh, he he really pulled off the composition so that you felt like this the threat of the male waste. Like from from the neck down was this fucking like weapon somehow that was coming at Piper Laurie from George C. Scott. The, we did two masters, two 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 masters that ran a full mag. 
I, John and Philip both were like, wow, what a luxury to run the scene all the way through. And I was like, wow, what do you mean? And I was like, some directors don't shoot a master or, or don't shoot or, or shoot it in such piecemeal that an actor never gets to run the scene from beginning to end. And I felt real, like, proud that, you know, like, all right, I, I, I did good for the actors, you know. But, but it wasn't like I was trying to, like, you know, be the actor-friendly director. And then, and then suddenly when he goes in the motel, you kind of, you go to movie land. You go to um, the sort of, the sort of rules of suspense, you know, which are, um, you know, as long as you cannot show them, don't show them. <laughs> um, which I think is a pretty good rule. And maybe this, the concept of just holding on Sydney and John in their faces, uh, sort of it tries to stretch that rule really far as let's watch them react. And then, um, as they move, we'll move with them, and then move into the room. You know, so it's not so it's not taking it too 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 far to a stylistic extreme. You know, it it lets the it lets the sort of um, their movement be our movement into the room. You know, but while they're sort of standing there, we get to just kind of watch them and watch their faces. And you know, it's great. It's great fun to watch an audience. And this this goes. You could boil this down to besides any sort of cinephile explanation of of all this stuff. It's fucking fun to watch an audience watch this movie and watch that section and watch them just go, what? show me, show me. On that level, you know, if you're just operating on that level, fuck, do it. That's great. You know, it's like an external emotional response from an audience. You know, I can remember my friend seeing this movie and it was just a rough cut screen that I had, but he, but he screamed and he was at the back of the theater. He said, show me, show me. And I was like, cool, you know. Just if we're gonna pretend that it's that that we're going for, then let's do that, you know. In a in a way, all three of the characters in this scene have a breakdown. This is like mass breakdown, and each each character has his own mode of coping with the 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 horror of what the various discoveries are. There's a lot of discovery for each of the actors in the scene, and and. The, the fun and, and also the challenge and the complexity of it is, is how, you know, and, and how masterfully he, he handled this, uh, not only in the writing, but in the, in the way he chose to film it and to, and to record it, uh, that he's dealing with his three major characters uh, all breaking down, all having life-altering discoveries, um, all in one. How long does that scene take to play? By the way? I don't even know. It's like, it's like 16 minutes. It is like about 16 minutes. Yeah, it's a... It's a big hunk of the movie. It's all, and then this was a tiny motel room too. It was very claustrophobic. It's a, yeah, this is a real location. <coughs> I don't, I don't, and imagine really all that equipment and all those people in there, um, plus room for us to to move around and and to to find our our spots and our spaces there. It was it was difficult. It was very very uh, hot and um, oppressive. Things that, that probably worked for the scene uh, in terms of the final result. But made it difficult to do. But also finding the finding the key, the appropriate key. You know, it's one thing to find the, the what I what I call the 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 right harm, harmonic for a given for a given moment or a given sequence. It's one thing to find that if you're by yourself in a scene, which is probably without dialogue. It's another thing when there are two, when there are three people in a scene, all of equal weight. Uh, it's very hard to find the key the right emotional color, a, a given actor's instinctive mode of, of making these discoveries, and then his subsequent breakdown, I don't know. Uh, an, an actor's mode of making these discoveries, and, and then his breakdown and his recovery would be one thing if there was only one actor there, uh, or if he were by himself. But with the three, the mix, it becomes very, very complicated for each actor to find the right key for the moment. It's easy to get off tune in a scene like this. Not because they're three people, but because they're three people of equal weight who all have huge tasks in the scene. Mm -hmm. We all have to make these amazing, amazing discoveries, and then we all have to, in our own way, fall apart with the discovery and recover and, and then come back together in some way. So there's, it's, it's a huge, huge scene. Probably the most difficult scene uh, in the movie, I, I would say. Whenever I'm in movies, I always think about it. I used to direct a lot in the theater. Uh, I've never directed a film, and I'm, and the more I learn about it, I'm, I, I know that I never will. It's 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 complicated beyond belief for, for a, a simple theater director. It's 
Um, uh, but I remember when we were filming this, I was thinking, oh, they all, where would you start? Where would you start? I mean, what, uh, I mean, start maybe with the logic of what's going on, but then what, what responses do we want? Who, whose face do we want to see? What reaction is more important than which other reaction? Mm -hmm. Which reaction advances the script? Okay, this one advances the mm -hmm. script, but this one inhibits the development of this character. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's like, whoa. It's like, in this kind of a scene, I mean, I don't, I don't know how you ever put it together, really. And with, with the fluidity, and I think everybody's character being properly served, the story being advanced, all this stuff, is like, it's, it's miraculous, really, how we put this together. Because it's, uh, in the theater, it's very common in a lot of uh, theater pieces, um, contemporary theater pieces especially, where each of the major characters has, as it were, a big scene. And we sort of see this coming. He's has his big scene. She's had hers. I wonder if... That other guy, when, when's he going to have, oh, there it is. He's going to have his now. So we sort of anticipate. But what's wonderful about, to me, what's wonderful about the way this scene is structured is that we're not, we don't get a sense of like, oh, okay, we're going to see John break down, and then we're going to see uh, Gwyneth break down, and then we're going to see Sydney break down. We don't get a sense that like we're going in sequence. Mm -hmm. um, it's like each, each one's going to have their big moment here. You don't get that sense at all. It's just like this thing is all just kind of flowing together. A million things can happen uh, that, that can that could throw it off, uh, that, could, that could throw it off track, or that could could ruin this this um, this invisible sensibility, this this um, fine tuning that we all had to each other. Again, acting acting is it is a mysterious business, um, uh, and the better the material, the more mysterious I think it becomes in a certain way. You may go through a scene one time, but let's say a very emotional scene, um, where where a lot of a lot of stuff is required emotionally from you but the third time you go through it your emotional equipment may be operating in a way that it, it does not repeat the way it did the other time it may go off in some other direction entirely now you've got two other actors there who are waiting for not the line cue let's say that there are no problems with the lines they're waiting for certain emotional cues they have been trained in the previous rehearsals the previous renters to expect certain emotional cues along the way. Now suddenly, you're off in a different direction. They're not getting those emotional cues. So now their work may begin to look false and empty because they were prepared for something that's not happening or something different is happening. So, and this is where a scene like this can really fall apart. And, and it can fall apart often to the degree that, that it cannot be resurrected. And then you, then you get into the question of temperament. And um, you get into some actors who, some wonderful actors who, um, a, as their as their technique or as their uh, ability to recreate emotionally what is essential in the scene begins to change or falter, some actors become very depressed or very angry when this begins to happen, and then be, and then really become incapable of maintaining this this through line that everybody else, including the director, has to have to make the scene work. So then that adds another thing to the mix. And then other actors then can be, begin to become resentful that the other actor <laughs> is not giving them what they need to get through it. It can really get out of control. <laughs> and um, obviously here it did not. And, I'm not. and I don't mean to suggest either that this was just three people who were all in love with each other who went up there and shot this thing in a perfect way. We did have some bobbles in this. We did have some falling down and getting up and dusting ourselves off and trying to restart. And I mean, it didn't all, it wasn't like all like, oh, it's great. What's the next scene? I got this one out of the way. Yeah. Um, this scene is the kind of scene that can make you old before your time because uh, actors can get out of control in a scene like this. And it can be very, very hard to get them all back together. Again, if it's, if it's a scene where one actor, where, where one character breaks down uh, and the other two are basically witnesses, that scene is easier to control uh, from a directorial standpoint. Because because there isn't as much, but where everybody has to to go through a change, all in one 15-minute deal, uh, there are just a million things that can happen, and some of them did happen to us, and you know, we somehow got through it anyway, and we're all still talking to each other. More than that, we all have great affection and respect for each other. So, but it's uh, it's an education.